Thank you very much. Uh, first, I wanted to thank very much Chris for a fantastic meeting. It's been great. And um, it's a real pleasure to talk to you about some of the work I've been doing with um, Mark Lawson over the last few years. And uh, it'll be a combination of many things you just saw, so I won't be as fancy a effect, effectus theory um, level as, as previous. I'll just be very elementary. But I hope to at least tell you a little bit about the stuff. However, because I have far too many slides, I will, in fact, probably stop and tell you stories from time to time instead. Uh, but let me just uh, uh, say, what are, what are um, many-valued logics? So these are logics whose uh, truth values are uh, originally developed. The truth values were in the interval 0, 1. And, um, they were developed in the 1920s in the Polish school by Łukasiewicz and uh, one of the students there named Tarski. And uh, they wrote a series of papers on them. And they were, Łukasiewicz was con interested not just in infinite valued logics, but in finite ones. And I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, also, Post in the United States, but Post was actually Polish, was uh, also working in these many valued logics. But it's kind of very old fashioned logic of the Hilbert style. And uh, then, uh, roughly, it's a funny subject. Every 30 years, something happens. Uh, uh, so um, in, uh, in the 1950s, Chang, the model theorist, uh, decided, as we heard in Mark's talk, uh, associated to any logic, you can get an algebra by looking at the so-called Lindemann-Tarski algebra. So two formulas are considered equivalent in a logic uh, uh, if and only if you can prove one implies the other and vice versa. And the equivalence classes, then, are given an algebraic structure depending on your propositional operators. So for example, in a classical logic, you'd get Boolean algebras. In intuitionistic logic, you get Heiting algebras. And for many valued logics, you get MV algebras. And uh, then what uh, Robert McNaughton, a computer scientist, uh, well, became a famous computer scientist in those days, was a mathematician, in his PhD thesis, uh, wrote a fantastic, uh, found a fantastic theorem which gave a, um, actually before Chang invented MV algebras, a few years before. And he just said, what is the Lindemann-Tarski algebra of many-valued logic? That is, what, in our language, what is the free MV algebra? What does it look like? And he gave a topological characterization, a very nice topological characterization. And I'll maybe mention that later. Then uh, we begin, the, uh, 30 years later, the uh, world of Mundici. So Daniela Mundici has developed a very powerful big school in uh, Italy uh, with colleagues and students. And um, already in the, um, he discovered that MV algebras have a very rich uh, mathematical structure, geometric, algebraic, topological. Um, he also showed that a very surprising result, which I'll be talking about, the deep connection of um, MV algebras with number one lattice ordered abelian groups but countable MV algebras with AFC star algebras. And this was, came as a big surprise to people. And uh, then uh, there are deep connections with analysis. There's a whole part of mathematics that's called MV mathematics. It's measure theory and algebraic topology and all, all stuff. And there's analogs of it, all that in that world. 30 years later, uh, I guess we could say the category theorists get into the act. Or, Category theorists, semi-group theorists, and universal algebra is getting the act. And uh, so it starts with uh, uh, Eduardo de Buc, a topos theorist, who gave the first chief representation of MV algebras. And then Maya Gerke has been uh, in, uh, working on that. Then in the uh, more recent topos literature, there's Morita equivalence, the general theory of Morita equivalence for coherent uh, theories, uh, algebraic in the sense of topo theory, coherent theories, uh, Olivia Caramello has shown how to look at uh, Morita equivalents for MB algebras. Uh, right here in Edinburgh, um, um, Alex Simpson worked in um, uh, adding uh, mu, that is, uh, least fixed point operators, to uh, Wukashevitz's uh, logics. And then, more, and then, really, what this talk is about is the coordinatization theorem. So, this is um, uh, Mark, Mark and I and uh, Fred Verung. And uh, Mundici himself, uh, we've been looking at using Boolean inverse monoids to um, coordinatize in the sense of von Neumann's continuous geometry, coordinatize MV algebra. So that's the program. Uh, of course, I won't be able to finish it today. But so what are all these things? What are these MV algebras, keep saying? So what are MV algebras? It's very simple. They're a very simple structure. They're just a commutative monoid 
where it has an involution on it, so not not x is x. The negation of zero, of the unit, is uh, absorbing, so x plus one is one. And finally, there's this weird axiom, not not x plus y plus y is not not y plus x plus x. The two sides are the same except you flip x and y. And so uh, you might wonder what, what are examples of these things. But before giving some examples, I'll point out that it took 60 years for people to realize, in fact, the commutative law is not needed. It's a consequence of the other laws. So that's kind of curious. Um, an example is a Boolean algebra, where the plus is join, and uh, ne negation is the Boolean complement. And then this funny equation is often called Chang's equation. Uh, Chang's equation there just says that join is commutative if you just unwind it. So eh, that's fine, but these are, that's not really very <laughs> interesting. The fundamental, uh, uh, one of the fundamental, in a precise sense, example is the interval 0, 1. And the interval 0, 1, uh, where you take the kind of probabilistic definition, not x is 1 minus x, and x plus y is x plus y if it's less than or equal to 1, and you just cut it off at 1 if it's bigger than 1. In a few minutes, by the way, keep this in mind, in a few minutes I'm going to say x plus y is undefined if it's bigger than 1. Those are partial. Those are going to be the effect algebras. But MB algebras were much earlier, and uh, they're total algebras. Um, and you can look at the same exact arithmetic, but just look at rationals in 0, 1, and dyadic rationals in 0, 1, or you could even look at finite number of points. These are the finite MB algebras. Um, Maybe it's time for a story. Um, so, uh, Wilkeshevis was a very traditional logician. He was very interested in, a very scholarly man. And he was very bothered by what, traditionally, what would many-valued logic be? What is three-valued logic or five-valued logic? What is this? Let alone the infinite. He already, in Tarski, already realized that you could have these infinite-valued logics. But, but it, even the finite ones, he was bothered. And then it turned out another Polish... Uh, uh, logician uh, 10 years later in the, that school named Ulam actually had an interesting idea of how to interpret this. So I'm going to play a game, say, with Mark. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, suppose I, I, um, I say uh, to Mark, uh, we're going to play 20 questions. And I look at numbers between one and a million, and I ask Mark, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to find the number he has in mind. So Mark, Mark makes a number. That's fine. Okay, he's thinking of a number. And so the first question I can ask him is, uh, is it between 1 and 500,000, or is it between 500,000 and a million? And he'll tell me yes or no. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> he's supposed to tell me which interval. <laughs> is it in the first interval? Yeah. Okay, it's in the first interval. So then I, I keep doing the same thing. I keep dividing in half and dividing in half and dividing in half. And it just so happens that 2 to the 19 is just under a million, and 2 to the 20 is over a million. And so in 20 questions, I can figure out what it is. But we all know Mark. And so Mark will, of course, try to fool me, and he'll sometimes tell a lie. Okay? <laughs> and so if he... Uh, 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 doesn't always tell the truth, what can you say? And so Mundici, in an article, and this was Ulam's question, and uh, this was in the 1930s, and Mundici wrote a paper, kind of an interesting little philosophy paper, uh, where he proved that you can give the, if you have a, 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 a game like that with k lies, uh, 20 questions with k lies, um, you can give a complete description of what's happening in the game in k plus 2 valued logic. So particularly if k is 0, if there are no lies, it's Boolean logic. Otherwise, you can get that. So, so it's one of the kind of interesting expressibility things, which perhaps um, Wilkeshevitz would have been happy with. I don't know. But anyway, um, a, a second example of an MB algebra now is a lattice ordered abelian group. So you take an ordered abelian group, um, a partially ordered uh, abelian group that has a translation invariant partial order. And if the order happens to be a lattice, it's called an L group. 
And then an L group has a positive cone. And in fact, uh, people are interested in axiomatizing these by putting axioms on the positive cone, but I won't bother about that. But you can say that you have an order unit in an L group, or sometimes a strong order unit, or an Archimedean order unit, if there's an element u, so that every element, imagine you're laying off with a ruler along the line. So in this case, uh, Achilles definitely passes the tortoise. That there's every element g is eventually passed by u plus u plus u n times for something. OK, so that, that is uh, an L group with an order unit. And so uh, if you have such a thing, we can form a, um, uh, an interval, which is all the, thing, all the elements between 0 and u. It's just a post set now, even though it looks like an interval, but it's just a post set. But if it is actually a totally ordered thing, it's called a chain. OK, so now if you, if you associate to any L group with an order unit the interval 0u with the plus for the linear logicians, I stuck in tensor just as a De Morgan dual of plus, just in case you like that stuff. Uh, and uh, star 0, 1. And so then x plus y is the cutoff of x plus y by using the lattice operation. x star is u minus x. And 1 is u, and 0 is the 0. And all the previous examples that I gave are all special cases of this. But Mundici realized something else. This gamma operation, which assigns g u, to a, uh, an MV algebra is functorial. Not only is it functorial, we can say more, that uh, let MV, now this is an equational category of algebras. MV is a, a total equational category. So this is a category of MV algebras and maps that preserve everything. And you look at the, cat the category of L groups and structure preserving maps. Then Mundici's first theorem, which he very modestly, what's going on here? Oh, he very modestly said uh, this is essentially just souping up Chang. But anyway, it induces an equivalence of categories between lattice-ordered uh, these groups and MV algebras, which takes G into there. The essential surjectivity of it is the tricky part, and that's what I'll come back to via effect algebras, a different proof than Mundici's. Um, I should say here this hides something, that there's something here, if you're a category theorist, that's a little bit bothering, bothersome, and I'll, I'll probably come back to it later, but I'll just mention MV algebras is an equational category, it's an equational class. These things are not even first order definable. Archimedean order unit is not even first order definable. So here you have a category which is equivalent to another category that's not even definable first order logic. So, so you have to be uh, a little bit uh, cautious here. Therefore, the category equivalence will not necessarily preserve theorems between the two subjects. And I'll come back to that. Um, so, what are some theorems? Uh, I'll stick to the infinite Lucas-Jacobs logic. Some theorems. The Chang completeness theorem was the first thing. And essentially, it says for a universal algebraist that the equational variety uh, is completely determined by 0, 1. What that means is an equation in the language of MV algebras is true in 0, 1, if and if it's true in any MV algebra. So you can use that both forwards and backwards. If you want to know if something is true in every MV algebra, you can check it in 0, 1. Conversely, if it's true in 0, 1, it's true in any MV algebra. So it's kind of a useful thing. That's a completeness theorem. Um, those are the equations I wrote in the previous slide. There. Those equations. Okay. So. Um, it's just equations? Do you mean formulas as well? Quantifiers and things? No, it's, they're universal, universally quantified equations. It's just an equational theory. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're talking about two different things. You were asking about the NV equation holds people on the other level. It's first order formulas of the structure, right? No, I mean as an equation. An equation in the language, an equation in the language. So it's a first order long language with universal quantifiers, and that's it, and equations. Okay, so a formula in that language, yeah. Um, and in corollary, you get the existence of free MV algebras immediately, because the free MV algebra on kappa generators is just all the functions from 0, 1 kappa into 0, 1, which includes the projections and closed under pointwise operations. Now, McNaughton's theorem is kind of cool. McNaughton's theorem says the free MV algebra is exactly the algebra of McNaughton functions. And what are McNaughton functions? 
These are continuous piecewise affine linear polynomial functions in n variables. So that means they look like summation a sub i, x sub i. Okay. Except the a sub i must be integers. Okay. So these are piecewise continuous. By the way, it follows immediately then that an equation holds in zero one if not if it holds in rationals, obviously by continuity. So this is a, a curious thing. So anyway, that's that's some, a little bit of MV algebra theory. Um, Algebra of MV algebras. There's lots of algebra. I won't go into it. He says there's MV analogs of all standard algebra. Radical ideals, Hilbert, Schmitz, Dellenzatz, uh, all the usual universal algebra, of course, uh, congruences, kernels, ideals, you know, all that stuff. Uh, first, second, third isomorphism theorems. I mean, you know, all that stuff fits. Also, uh, spectral spaces. Uh, there's a whole, any, just take your standard graduate course in algebra. It's all done, can be done in MV theory. Um, I thought I would briefly mention some geometry of MV algebras, and uh, there's a whole fancy slide here. Only, only thing we need is this. A rational polyhedron is a union of finitely many rational polytopes. These are subsets of Rn definable by MV terms. So what are the maps between polytopes? Well, it turns out that in the literature they already existed in algebraic geometry, funny enough. If you take we're going to look at McNaughton functions, but now on R instead of 0, 1. In fact, it was McNaughton's observation that these things from algebraic geometry, he said, ah, when I actually look at the NV terms, they always land in 0, 1 instead of in R. But he said, okay, let's just look at piecewise McNaughton functions, that is piecewise linear, uh, uh, affine linear, with integer coefficients, uh, continuous functions, and uh, from uh, a subset of Rn to R, that's called a Z map. So that's what they call them. And now, if you take two P and Q subsets of Rn, a Z map from P to Q is one whose projection, each component, is a Z map. So these are McNaughton functions from Rn to R. And these are the continuous transformations of polyhedra definable by MV terms. So here's one of the standard uh, results in the uh, um, Mundici school, the Mara and Spada that the category of finally presented MV algebras and homomorphisms is equivalent to the opposite of the category of rational polyhedra and Z-maps. Which you might think is, ah, that's a very technical result. Who would possibly wonder about that? But now I'm going to tell you this funny story. Um, it turned out that there was Abelian lattice-ordered L-group theory, and there's MV algebra theory, and they're separate branches of mathematics, and they each proved a bunch of theorems which are exactly analogous to each other, neither one knowing the other one, what the other was doing. And moreover, because of what I mentioned earlier, the theorems don't transfer by the Mundici equivalence. They don't actually transfer. But I'll just, uh, the person involved here is Bainan, an interesting English um, uh, topologist. Here was a typical Bainan theorem, the full subcategory of the category of finitely, present, finitely generated lattice ordered abelian groups uh, is equivalent to the dual of the category whose objects are rational Euclidean closed polyhedral cones, blah, blah, blah. So I won't go into that except to mention this is a chart from one of his papers of Mara and Mundici. The MV world is on the left, and the L world, L groups world, is on the right. And they had a whole series of Chang's theorem, Weinberg's theorem, McNaughton's theorem, Bainan's theorem. Free algebras exist, free L groups exist. You go on and on and on, done completely independently of each other. Usually MV people did it first, but not always. And neither one knew what the other one was doing. Okay. Um, okay. This was way before Mundici. This was in the 70s. So, so this. Okay. So now we're going to move to effect algebras. And here uh, I was. Pronounce the name Stain. Stain. I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, I was particularly uh, happy when you mentioned about measurement theory yesterday that you, me you mentioned that when you do experiments, we take a classical viewpoint. And this is very important. Um, um, we're going to be interested in or uh, effects. And uh, the, uh, these are effects of measurements. But we're going to take physics from the viewpoint of classical. The instruments are classical, even if you're observing quantum phenomena. And, and it's very important that effects are, are done uh, uh, in this classical uh, uh, observational way. And so you have a complex Hilbert space of a quantum system, and there's a theory called 
quantum measurement, where people have studied a lot, but again, it's using classical effects, uh, classical observations, sorry. And so here is kind of a more old-fashioned treatment than the fancy new effectives theory, but uh, of effect algebras. Uh, this was Fallos and Bennett. This was in 94, but it's funny, the other paper actually occurred earlier, but anyway. Um, an effect algebra, I'm uh, being a logician, I like to use Kleene inequality. This says, if the left-hand side is defined, then the right-hand side is defined, and they're equal. So this is a partial commutative monoid, where uh, in addition, so it's, an, uh, it's a, a set with a partial operation and two constants, 0 and 1. And if 0 plus a is, is defined, then uh, 0 plus a is equal to a. The other thing is we demand it's orthocomplemented. For every a, there is a unique a prime, such that a plus a prime is 1. That means it's defined n equal 1. And finally, if a plus 1 is defined, then a is 0. It's called 0, 1 law. And those, those are the axioms of effect algebras by Fallis and Bennett in 94. They were an American school, but in fact, the majority of the work has been done by um, the Europeans. There's the Eastern European School of Dvergensky, Yenka and Pulmanova, and then uh, Nijmegen, uh, the Fecta school. Um, let me begin by giving some trivial examples, or post examples. Boolean algebra, um, x plus y is the join if they're, if they're disjoint, undefined else. Here I gotta say, George Bull, this is actually written in George Bull's works. If you read George Bull, he said, you can only combine quantities that, that, that are disjoint. And so, so George Bull actually was doing effectus theory. He wasn't doing Boolean algebras. Uh, uh, and then orthomodular lattices, where, the, again, the, the sum is the join. But now, not only are they disjoint, but x is below the negation. OK, okay fine. So th those are, that's that. And uh, here are the there's the main example. Again, we're looking at ordered abelian groups. Order, uh, sorry, we're looking at uh, um, ordered abelian groups, not necessarily lattice order, with a, a unit here. You can even take the unit as just an arbitrary element of the positive cone. And you take, the again, the interval. And then you take uh, uh, a plus b to be a plus b if it's less than or equal to the upper thing, and otherwise undefined. So in that case, that's 0, 1 where x plus y bigger than 1, undefined. And a negation is uh, uh, that. And uh, the standard effect algebra that all the uh, 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 people look at in the field is um, the effects. So you take the group then, it's a special case of this, you take the group being the self-adjoint operators on the Hilbert space under addition. Not under, my analyst friends always say, that's ah, not, a, not a group. No, no, under addition, under addition. And then uh, uh, you take bounded linear operators, uh, self-adjoint ones. Your G plus then is the positive cone, is, is the positive operators, in the lunar order, of course. And O is constant 0, I is the identity, and we're looking at the interval then, 0, I. And the elements in here are called fuzzy or unsharp measurements. And the self-adjoint uh, idempotence, that is the projections, are the sharp measurements. Uh, one of the big uh, gurus in the field uh, uh, named Gooder, Stan Gooder, has written many books on quantum probability theory. And he actually has four kinds of probability theory. So there's sharp and uh, fuzzy, and then classical and quantum. And you put them all, you four possible versions of, of probability theory. Um, uh, now we've, have, we've already seen the uh, effectuses. Uh, so if you take predicates, if you take predicates and you assume some reasonable pullback conditions on 1 plus 1, then you get a, a, a fibered functor like that, and uh, you get, a, uh, you get uh, examples of, uh, of uh, algebras, of uh, effect algebras. For example, set semi-rings, ring op, C star algebras, positive unit maps, op, and various other things. All right. Um, effect algebras have various uh, additional algebraic properties. The only two I want to mention are cancellation and, posit and conicalness, or positivity. Cancellation says if a plus c1 is a plus c2, then c1 is c2. And being conical says if a plus b is 0, then a and b are both 0. Okay. In computer science, it's often called positive. Um, effect algebras form a category. 
Uh, so you just take maps which preserve one, and whenever a plus b is defined, then f a plus a b is defined, and and uh, that is um, that equation holds. There are other notions of, of what a map could be in partial algebras, but we won't look at those. They're not very interesting for our purposes. So you get a category of effect algebras. You might want to ask now, since I've gone and introduced these MB algebras, how are they related to effect algebras? Well, it turns out that um, I'm going to say an effect algebra satisfies the Ries decomposition property if whenever you have A is less than or equal to a sum, then A itself can be written as a sum where the sum ands are pointwise less than or equal to. Now, that's the Ries decomposition property. Now, it turns out that's equivalent in, in order to be in groups to interpolation and many, many other versions of it. But in effect algebras, you have to be very careful. They're not all equivalent for effect algebras. This is the one I'll take. And uh, anyway, the theorem is an effect algebra is an MV effect algebra if and only if it's lattice ordered and has a Ries decomposition property. So that's the connection. But it's not so benign because you have to be really careful about maps. The maps are actually wrong. Uh, if you uh, take MV algebras and effect algebras, the only maps from 0, 1 to 0, 1 it is just the identity. That's it. But if you take in the world of MV algebras the maps from 0, 1 squared to 0, 1, you get the two projections. But as we heard before, the whole point of effect algebras is a convex structure. So you can take convex combinations of maps from 0, 1 squared to 0, 1. So in fact, you get uncountably many effect algebra maps. So yeah. you have to be a little careful with maps. Um, associated to now, now you might ask, uh, is there any kind of representation theorem? There isn't. As far as I know, there aren't any really smooth representation terms like for MV algebras, for effect algebras. But there's one kind of very interesting one uh, uh, that sort of goes part way. If you start with an effect algebra, with a Ries decomposition property at least, because that's getting closer to MV, then it turns out that there is a universal monoid that you can, um, uh, a total monoid that E can be embedded in. So this is by a general universal construction. What's interesting is that it's a abelian, free, cancellative, and satisfies universal property. And then, if you, once you have a cancellative abelian monoid, it has a Grothendieck D group. Essentially, it's the group that constructs Z from N by formally adjoining negatives. And so then you get, uh, um, you get the following interesting theorem. If I take the, uh, uh, an effect algebra with Ries decomposition property and take its universal group, then this thing satisfies the following. That if I take the image of 1 under this map, that gives me an element. And it turns out that E is isomorphic to that unit interval, that, that, that post set. So it's an interval effect algebra. Ba interval effect algebra in the, its universal group. And moreover, if uh, it actually turned out that it started out with an, was an NV algebra to begin with, then it turns out this is actually an L group. And this gives you back Mundici's there by this strange sideways route. Um, I don't think I'll have time to, to talk about the proof. It's kind of a very interesting proof. It's due to, Rein, it's due to some techniques due to Reinhold Baer in 1949. But I'll, I think I'll skip that proof. And let me, since I advertise AFC star algebras, let me briefly mention what they are. So we've already heard uh, uh, AFC star algebras, but I'll just mention that a finite dimensional C star algebra is just a direct product of matrix algebras, complex matrix algebras of those sizes. And it turns out that the list of, of sizes there is an invariant. And AFC star algebras uh, are those which are, uh, AF means approximately finite. That means they're co-limits uh, by Bratley Bratley was the one who introduced the terminology, I guess. Co-limits of um, finite dimensional C star algebras and certain kinds of star algebra maps. And these are called uh, standard maps. And I want to mention them very briefly. Um, so I'm sorry, this is kind of a busy looking slide. But here I have one MV, uh, sorry, one uh, uh, finite dimensional C star algebra. And I have another. So two direct products of matrices algebras. And I want to define a map from A to B. Since this is a product, I'll just go into one component. 
So how do you go into one component? You take a tuple of matrices here, K matrices, and you just stick them as block diagonal matrices along the diagonal. How many times do you do it? Well, you put them in a certain number of times. You scatter these Sij's. There's a number of multiplicities you put in the diagonal. And those are called multiplicities, and, but it has to fit. And it has to be unital, the, the map that I'm building. So I have to demand that the sizes add up to the size of the matrix you're mapping into. And then I do it for tuples, and that's called a standard star map. And, and then the theorem, and it's determined, of course, by this matrix of these, of these uh, multiplicities, uh, integer matrix multiplicities. So uh, then the theorem of Bratley is that any AF C star algebra is isomorphic to a co-limit of a system of matricial C star algebras and standard map, maps, which is the same thing as saying morally you have, you have a union of a kind of a chain of these things and you close it up. That, that's what an AF C star algebra is. Uh, now Bratley introduced them, oops, uh, Bratley introduced some important uh, diagrammatic uh, uh, language. I don't know if I'll, I'll spend a little bit, a tiny amount of time here. Uh, so a Bratley diagram then, uh, what we developed these, this calculus, or he did, where you have uh, vertices, and you start off with a root at the top, and then you go down, although I'll be actually writing them sideways. Um, and uh, at level I, you say you put those, those sizes of the matrices. At the next level down, you have another sizes of the matrices, and then you have edges, directed edges going down. How many edges do you have? Sij, those coefficients, the number of, of flips. And so I, I wrote, I don't know if you can see this, I actually wrote one out of Vaughan Jones's uh, lectures, uh, one of his, he says, if you take C plus M2 into M3 plus M5 plus M2, so I'll just do one level of this, that Bratley diagram. He says you take XA and you map it to XA on the diagonal here, XA goes to XAA here because it has to be dimension 5 and then A goes to A and then you can, you can just draw a number of connections and that, that's anyway, that's a, the, the way that they do it and there's a whole technology of these things and it's a separate branch of math I'm not sure I know how to do this ah, no, that's not right no. is that right? no, that's too dark what happened? Number two. Okay. Oh, okay. So um, anyway, uh, there's quite a technology of these things, and the point is that you can associate to one of these diagrams at each level z z z z z. So you have z to the k, and you use that number m1 to m k as the order unit, and that gives me an L group, an order unit. And then the going down the diagram gives me a series of star maps, and I take a co-limit along these things, and those co-limits, co-limits of those groups are called dimension groups, and they've been separately now. And so then, anyway, uh, George Eliot was very interested in classifying these AFC star algebras, and he started this program. So here's another little story. He started this program, and um, and apparently I, I understand that uh, when he first did it people were a little bothered because he constructed a partial monoid in there and he used that he used manipulations with this partial monoid and this more modern viewpoint which was David Hanneman and the others brought in and they said no no forget this partial stuff that's not you know not the way we do things we'll use this and then when he did this everybody was interested but the important thing was that partial monoid was an effect algebra so he was already ahead of the game uh, um, um, and his classification. So it's a big mathematical project is the classification of these things. So um, I'll just mention, uh, well, here I don't have much time. If you know what a K0 group is, that's fine. If you don't, what you do is you look at idempotence as a category, so so-called Kurubi envelope, and you look at isomorphisms of idempotence, and then uh, what you want to do is then to construct an abelian group or a partially ordered abelian group out of these isomorphism classes by taking the, the Grotendi construction on top of that. And so it turns out it's rather tricky for AFC star algebras. If you look in Goodall's book, it takes many pages to prove the main theorems. Anyway, here is Modici's theorem 2. 
uh, that if we look at our gamma functor, remember we had our gamma functor, and now I take for my, um, I look at the category of AFC star algebras whose K0 is lattice ordered. And I look at the category of countable MV algebras, and the theorem is that that Mundici functor gamma actually lifts to a functor by sticking for my group K0 and my uh, unit, the identity here, that interval is actually a, um, uh, a functorial operation from lattice order, uh, from these, um, this category of AFC star algebras with lattice ordered K0 into MV, and this is an equivalence of categories. So this is a, uh, was a major thing. It was a big article in the Journal of Functional Analysis, and it was very surprising at the time. Um, so, for example, here are some examples of Mundici, that if you have an MV algebra and you have its correspondent. So, for example, finite MV algebras, or finite dimensional AFC star algebras, the dyadic rationals, remember I said the dyadic rationals could form, under the operations, could form a, uh, an MV algebra. Well, you get the car algebra of a Fermi gas. If I take the rationals in 0, 1, I get Glim's universal UHF algebra. If I go back and look at uh, the free on one generator, the McNaughton functions, in one variable, it's exactly what Mundici and Boca later independently developed. It's called the Ferry AFC star algebra. So there's a whole series of these things, and, and, they're, and now we can use Mundici's techniques to study them. So what? Fine. <clears throat> what are Mark and I doing? <clears throat> so um, here I thought I would go back and mention von Neumann. In a, a curious article in the um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. in 1936, von Neumann says, the purpose of these investigations reported in this note is to complete the elimination of points, lines, and planes from geometry. <laughs> so you might say, uh, what's left? <laughs> well, what von Neumann said is what's left is a complemented modular lattice of subspaces together with a dimension function. And the subspaces themselves correspond to principal right ideals of a von Neumann regular ring. And so this is what he called continuous geometry and the coordinatization program. And he coordinatized various things. And then he had a series of 11, 12 papers with Murray afterwards. And what happened was the mathematics was terrific, von Neumann algebras, the program died. Nobody was interested in the program. Nobody's ever written any books except von Neumann on continuous geometry. However, um, Mark and I decided to revive, ramp this and uh, look, instead of having von Neumann regular rings, we're going to have von Neumann regular semigroups and redo the program for MV algebras. So we want to represent MV algebras as lattices of principal ideals of a Boolean inverse semigroup. And that's what we'll be doing. <clears throat> And uh, what I should just say, what we have, or what has been done, is the um, in our paper um, uh, we did finite and dyadic rationals, and then I had a student who did um, the rationals in zero one and a Chang al algebra. I probably won't have time to talk about that. Very strange, interesting algebra. <clears throat> and Mundici himself did the free on one generator. So. Um, <clears throat> Let me just, I, I probably don't need to say too much about this because Mark has already tell, told us about inverse semigroups, but just to remind you, it says that there are semigroups with the property every element has a unique pseudo-inverse. And uh, it turns out that being, uh, and the fundamental examples, <coughs> in fact, the only example I'll be talking about today is partial bijections on a set. So uh, we, that's called a symmetric inverse monoid. And the item potents correspond to identities on subsets. And if you take finite Cartesian products of these things, these are called uh, semi-simple. And <clears throat> um, if we start with a semi-group, we look at its um, set of uh, item potents, we can, by analogy with partial functions, you can just define A inverse A to be the domain and this to be the range. And that's what it would be in the case of functions, partial functions. And uh, you could define a, uh, an order. And uh, Mark mentioned the fact that a Boolean one, a Boolean inverse semigroup is one where the idempotents form a Boolean algebra, compatible elements have joins, and multiplication distributes over finite joins. 
And, uh, well, so he's already mentioned that. So I'll just mention a couple of other structures that happen to be floating around in the world. The group of units of any um, uh, inverse monoid makes sense. Um, these are the invertible elements. And in the case of the uh, um, partial bijections, then the uh, group of units is just a symmetric group. And uh, we say that uh, uh, an inverse semigroup is a uh, um, Factorizable if every element is below a unit. And um, it, that turns out in the case of uh, partial bijections to be the same as the set being finite. And uh, uh, it's fundamental if the centralizer, the only thing that commutes with idempotents are idempotents. Okay, so um, oh, non commutative sum duality, you've already heard, I'll, I'll skip that. Mark spoke about that. <clears throat> but um, I'll just mention now a couple of relations that are sometimes occur in literature. There's the J relation and the D relation. Happily, they're equal in all the categories that we're, all the classes we're interested in. But the J relation just says two elements are J related if their principal ideals, two sided ideals, are equal. That's all. And the D relation on the idempotents, although it can be extended to the whole thing, is that two elements are D related if this picture tells you everything. If um, there is an element A, and E can be looked at as the domain of A, and F can be looked at as the range of A. So, so in other words, there's an element A where E, e is, is the domain of that element, and F is the range. Okay. And now, the type monoid. So we introduced this in our, our paper, and it's turned out to be an object of great study by Fred Veron, that if you look at the idempotence module of the D relation, which is the same as the J relation here, and S is Boolean, then... Um, we can form a, um, a structure, an effect algebra structure, in the following way, or begin to find a, an effect algebra structure by saying E plus F are summable if you can find orthogonal idempotents, and then you define the sum to be the, the class of the joint of the orthogonal idempotents, otherwise just undefined. And then the theorem is that if you have a factorizable Boolean inverse monoid, then this type monoid here is an effect, not only an effect algebra, it satisfies the Ries decomposition property. And that has a name. I think we decided to call that a Thalus monoid. Okay. And so here, finally, we're getting to the theorem. Um, for Thalus monoids, it turns out that, uh, as I said, D is J. And so we can identify the D classes with the post set of principal ideals. And I'm going to say that uh, this thing satisfies a lattice condition if that's a lattice. Therefore, it becomes an MV algebra. So the coordinatization theorem says every countable MV algebra, given an countable MV algebra, there's a phallus monoid S satisfying a lattice condition such that A is isomorphic to the lattice of ideals. And... Um, as MV algebras. And uh, so, so we've uh, actually, Fred Veron then has souped this up a bit, although we haven't really completely gathered, understood his proof. It uses a bit of set theory. Uh, but it's true not only for cardinal all of zero, but for all cardinals. But things get weird at all of two. And so you have, to, you have two separate arguments for all of things below all of one and, and, and all of two. Anyway, uh, uh, so this coordinatization theorem does have a, a kind of generalization, but here um, we're making a stronger condition on the S. So um, now you might ask, how would you do this? And one way to do it, and I'll, here I'm being very rough, but if you take your Bratley diagrams, remember every place we put a Z in there, and we took the co-limit, we got these dimension groups. So instead of doing that, just put put the matrix, matrix associated to a partial bijection. <clears throat> so that's a, a, what's called a rook matrix. It's one where every row and column have at most one one. So you do the whole thing. So the partial bijections are the same, obviously the same thing as a rook matrix, because you just say the ij element is 1 if f of j is equal to i. So, so that gives you a, a, a bijection between ins and rook matrices, do the whole theory for rook matrices, and here's what happens. <coughs> you have your Bratley diagram here, and at each level, instead of putting z to the something, you put the partial bijections on a set of cardinality 
um, um, well, if you had m1 to mk as the tuple of dimensions, you just take im1 cross 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 imk. And those, and those uh, special maps, it turns out, there's a very pretty theory of special maps that's the analog in, 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 uh, of the ones in the Bratley maps. The analog of those works very nicely in inverse semigroups. So we have a section of our paper on that. So if you take this, these special maps and you take colimit, you get a monoid. And that's, by definition, an AF inverse monoid. So an AF inverse monoid looks just like an AF algebra, but, but uh, you, you, you just use these partial bijections, so it's the limit of products of partial bijections. OK. Uh, oh, this is a busy slide. It essentially says that co-limits of chains of, of, of uh, inverse monoids with meets uh, inherit all the nice features. They have the groups of units, the direct limits of the groups of units of the SI. And the co-limit of an SI is isomorphic to the Bratley diagram uh, I of B, what I just defined, the, the inverse monoid associated to a Bratley diagram. So every one of these omega sequences of inverse monoids and injective morphisms of the kind that I've been talking about, the co-limit of those things actually arises from a Bratley diagram. So that's, that's the nice thing. And so then the theorem is that uh, AF inverse monoids are certain kinds of Boolean inverse monoids in which D preserves complementation. The groups of units are direct limits of finite direct products of finite symmetric groups. And those people have been looking at. The Russians have been classifying these things. It seems very interesting. So the uh, coordinatization theorem, I think maybe I'll stop with the coordinatization theorem. Anyway, the coordinatization theorem says every countable uh, MV algebra, there, there's associated a Foulis monoid whose la lattice of ideals is exactly isomorphic to it. And so um, I won't give the proof, but uh, I wanted to mention uh, something along the way. What are these AF inverse monoids? We had actually wondered about that. And so Mark and I were recently, this is some things we were playing around with. And the goal was to characterize AF inverse monoids abstractly and connect it up with work of Krieger and Verung. Um, so um, let's look at the partial bijections on the set 1 through 7. So, uh, so let's look at, oops, yeah, 1 through 7. And um, let alpha be uh, the identity on 2, 3, union 4, 5, 6. Then alpha can be written as the identity on 2, 3, join 4, 5, join 5, 6, join 6, 4. As, that's a permutation here. And that can be written as a join of these things. So this is a very strange thing that an arbitrary element in here, partial bijection, can be written as an idempotent, that is a sub-identity, joined together with little, little maps. This is a partial map. It takes 4 to, four to 5. And that, that's, that's all it does. It's just a pair 4, 5. Take, so join of infinitesimals. That's square root of 0. So this monoid is called a property of being basic. So, so this thing has the additional property. It's a basic thing. Uh, that Every, every uh, orthogonal join here can be written as a join of an idempotent with a finite number of infinitesimals. And a Krieger monoid is a, a locally finite basic Boolean inverse monoid. And the theorem is that countable Krieger monoids are the same, exactly the same as AF inverse monoids. Which you might think, all right, fine. But that has an interesting corollary. Because, um, and here I have to mention, Mudici one time said that uh, MD algebras are, you might want to think of them as sort of like non-commutative Boolean algebras. And, and, and the question we were bothered by is, what does he mean, sort of? So here is the theorem. Commutative uh, AF inverse monoids are exactly countable Boolean algebras. And um, here's the proof. It's actually pretty easy. Suppose S is a commutative AF inverse monoid, and suppose S is actually an infinitesimal. Then multiply both sides by S inverse, and you get S inverse S squared S inverse is 0. By commutativity, you can flip those S inverse S the same as S inverse, and then you get S inverse S is 0, and so S is 0. So that means there are no non-zero infinitesimals. But the monoid is basic, so all the elements are idempotents. That mean, and we know the idempotents form Boolean algebra, so all the elements form Boolean algebra. So, so. so it's kind of, you know, tells us a little bit of the story there. F 
fine. Uh, I thought I would mention now, uh, let's see, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. I'll just briefly zip through a couple of coordinatizations uh, and, and show you. Uh, I won't mention the finite ones. You can look that up on the slides. But in 1977, Kuntz studied C-star algebras of isometries of a separable Hilbert space in a very um, seminal paper. And these same structures also arose in uh, wavelet theory and in formal language theory. And so we'll look at that now. Uh, so take Cantor space. So take a finite set, discrete topology, take countable, take product topology. And uh, I want to describe CN, the nth quince inverse monoid. So, um, so for example, if, if n is 2, I'll, I'll just let a be the set AB. Now, the Clopin subsets have the form x to the a omega, where x is a, um, a subset of the finite words on a. And it's not any old subset. It's called a prefix code. So there are finite subsets such that close up. If, if y is a prefix of x, then x equals y. So, so this is part of this strange topology. And then, unfortunately, the representation of Clopin subsets by prefix codes is not unique using computer science um, notation. A, A omega, so A followed by a, an infinite word here, can be either the next letter is an A or the next letter is a B, and then an infinite word after that. So these two are two different representations of the same set. But if you want to uh, uh, make prefixes in clopins uniquely representable, you can put a weight on them, and then a standard theorem is that every clopin is generated by a unique prefix code of minimal weight. And then uh, Mark uh, introduced uh, these, uh, this way of talking about the Quince inverse monoids by looking at the partial bijections, then, on these infinite words, and look at those partial bijections on prefix sets of the same cardinality. So you just map there to there. So the xi followed by an infinite word is y. I followed by an infinite word. And then the theorem uh, in an early paper of his is that CN is a Boolean inverse meat monoid whose set of idempotents is a um, unique countable atomless Boolean algebra. Its group of units is the Thompson group. Yeah. But um, um, we're interested in uh, uh, those partial bijections where when you map XI to YI here, that prefix here, is actually the same length. So let's stick to those. And that's called the dyadic inverse monoid. And the theorem is that the MV algebra of dyadic rationals is exactly coordinatized by that. Which means that you can then write sort of as, as AF algebras or union, kind of unions with a closure. You can write this thing as partial bijections on 2, embedded that into partial bijections on 4, embed that into partial bijections on 2 to the n. Just go up. And that's, the, that's uh, the, the inverse monoid. That's the Carr inverse monoid. And that's the uh, associated to the Carr algebra of a Fermi gas. By the way, if, if you care about that, the group of units of those things is going to be a co-limit of the symmetric group on, on 2, on 4, on 8. So the co-limit of that class of groups. Um, OK, so to go through the whole proof, though, it involved a lot of a bit of work of Handelman and Bernoulli measures and so on. So I'll, I'll skip that. But it was a kind of interesting uh, uh, proof. Just wanted to mention some, uh, I had a master's student who decided to work on some of this stuff. And he got interested in um, the, the rationals in, in 0, 1. And so he said a sequence of numbers is omnidivisional if it satisfies that the sequence satisfies ni divides ni plus 1 for every i. And for every m, there is an i such that m divides ni. And if you look, for example, at n factorial, that's an example of omnidivisional one. And then uh, the theorem is that uh, if you have an omnidivisional sequence, then if you take, <coughs> you can very carefully define embeddings of one into the other. So these are going to be the analog of those um, kind of Bratley maps. And then they're kind of carefully defined. But you can define a set of standard embeddings from one partial bijection into the next, into the next, into the next, indexed by uh, uh, omnidivisional sequence. And the theorem is that, the co-limit of that, coordinatizes the rationals. Okay. And uh, 
Well, I think I'll perhaps stop here. Thank you.